So, if you want to be a whetstone cutter and you want to try to source your own natural sharpening stones, here's a short video of what goes into the process of making a natural whetstone. So, here you can see my big pile of attempts and it's right outside the door of the shop because a lot of times you're gonna cut open a stone and you're gonna discard it. Like probably 50% of the time. If you have to carry home maybe a 25 pound piece of stone, 30 pound piece of stone, then you're probably gonna actually throw away more than half of it. Cause if you look at this rock, you can see, well, he's got a fair bit of fracturing and then you turn it and you try to see where does the fracturing end. And I took this one home because it looks like it stops. This end was beat on as well, but that end looks like it's in better shape. So that's just an example of the viewing process. When you're out in the field and you're looking at a rock, if it looks like fractures run through it in every single direction, then maybe that's not a good choice to take home. But if it's a bigger stone and you have bigger cutting capabilities, then you can start to gamble a little more. You can see mother nature's trying to reclaim them but I use some pallets to try to keep everything together, keep a lot of it out of the lawn. When you're out in the field and you're hunting for rocks, if you're not near a water source, it's a lot harder because when a stone is wet, you can kind of, you can see better what its color will look like. So that gives you a look to at familiar grain patterns or certain strata that you might remember from previous cuts. And you'll sometimes see where adjacent layers of the jasper are together. So also, a lot of times these stones have a bit of a rind and the color is slightly deeper on the inside. And it just takes a lot of experience and practice when you're cutting to know what's good that you want to take home. So the next part of this process is cutting. And here for our setup at naturalwhetstonesharpening.com, I really like running Highland Park slab saws. Now, a lot of people would keep it secret they have one of these saws if they're in production because they don't want everybody to go buy their own saw and copy them. But if you wanna get into this, go ahead, go spend the 6,000 bucks and get one of these because they're incredible. This is actually one from around 1965 or 1970. It belonged to a professor at a geology school, and then he passed on after using it probably for 25 or 40 years. And then it went to this guy, Michael, who was my mentor and really kind of gave me the, the understanding of what I was getting into by getting into lapidary work. So, and then it came to me after it was in Tucson, Arizona for quite a while. So about six years ago, we drove down there and got it. These saws have an automatic shutoff switch and this one's been tripped. So before I open the lid, I need to reset it to the safe position. And then we'll open this guy up with two hands. And here's a look inside the saw. So you can see the carriage has traveled to the set point that I left so that it would shut off right where I wanted it to. And because I'd already made a previous couple of cuts before, and this carriage has a crossways system. See how the carriage actually, it's on this screw. So you can, you can pull it over to adjust for how thick of a cut you wanna make. And because you don't have to unclamp the stone and, and change the way you've gripped the rock, you can get really flat parallel cuts. Now, if you're cutting a hard stone like Jasper, you need to cut slow. And we use oil as the coolant, so the saw is sitting in mineral oil and it's uh, 70 weight and that's key for the life of the diamond blade as well as safety and health. Now, you don't want to breathe the vapor that the saw makes at all. You don't want any of that in your body, even if it's a non-toxic oil. For example, diesel is <laughs> an option some people use and it's fuel. So if you're not careful, you'll burn your whole shop down and I highly don't recommend it. That said, I tend to do things people don't recommend just to see why it sometimes works. And I stop usually after that because I don't want to push it until something critical fails. But at one point I did put diesel in the saw and I wasn't running it in this current setup. It was outside and you know, it was, it was like that bad advice you take in life sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> don't do it. It was a horrible mess to clean and it took a long time to get the diesel out of the saw. Um, another thing people use is like um, motor oil and like 
uh, mag tech and stuff like that don't do that either all those oils are very carcinogenic um, back in the day before people really were health conscious about this a lot of people they died because you know you cut rocks without a mask on and you're getting all those minerals inside your body and uh, same with whatever coolant you're using and even if you use water you still have to not breathe the spray because the spray is carrying all the silicates and uh, silicates are basically what runs this business because all these stones are ultra hard micro crystalline varieties of quartzite which are kind of ranging from jasper and chalcedony to quartzite and they're they're slightly different stones but they're all pretty similar and not every whetstone that you cut is actually going to be a suitable candidate so you'll have to experiment you'll also need a serious setup if you're going to cut stones that have a higher mohs hardness like the jasper that we work if you just want to start with cutting something like slate then you can cut slate with just a tile saw. All right, so that releases the carriage from the feed screw. And also I'm gonna release these thumb screws down here. I don't know if you guys can see without me getting my phone in the oil. But yeah, that makes it so it's pinned to the bar the carriage is on. And now I'm gonna be really careful not to bump the on switch. And yeah, you can see very straight and smooth cut. And if I give the blade some travel, you'll see that my saw blade doesn't dance too much because if it's moving back and forth like this, then you know your saw blade's not flat. And that'll show up as soon as you try to cut anything. So it's very critical to always use ultra hard clamping. And if you're gonna cut on a tile saw, you're gonna wanna try to improvise some sort of clamp. No matter what though, with a tile saw, you're gonna spend more time flattening the surface most likely. And that's gonna go faster for softer stones and take a lot longer for harder stones. It can take uh, four to six hours to lap a big slab of Jasper just at the rough grit, just to get the saw marks out. So because I've been running this saw for a while, next I'm gonna do an oil change. I'm gonna switch to some fresher oil because the lubricity is changing. And once this thing gets too filled up with the clay, it stops uh, having the, prep, the proper uh, slipperiness. It, it doesn't have enough glide and it gets too thick and then your cut gums up when you start to try to cut bigger stones. All right, so we're back in the shop. It's actually been 24 hours. I cleaned out the inside of the saw. I took out about five buckets of oil and sludge and I'm gonna work on separating the oil out of the sludge. While that's settling and then it gets filtered, I can work with some clean oil. And what happens is, is if you don't change your oil and it's got a few inches of sludge in the bottom, eventually the sludge actually mixes with the oil so well. And then the oil is not actually protecting the diamonds of the blade. So the biggest reason not to use water with a slab saw is rust. Everything inside of here is steel and you'll eventually have your saw rusting out, your arbor will rust, the carriage the feed, feeding mechanisms. Uh, eventually you'll have holes in the corners of your tank. So don't use water because if you use water, then you're having rust. And if you add an anti-rust additive to your water, then you have toxicity problems. So the best, healthiest choice is light mineral oil. So I've put about 20 gallons in here, roughly. And that's just enough that the saw blade is barely touching the oil. You want it to cover just over the teeth. So I'm gonna grab some gloves real quick and show you how we position one of the stones for cutting next. A few considerations. When you're cutting a large stone, you need to not ride into this washer and the carriage is actually not taller than the height of that washer. So the way to get around that is put a board that takes up the difference under the stone. And then the next thing to consider is your height. So with this stone stood up as is, the lid barely closes. If you have a stone that's actually pushing on the lid, you don't want to start the cut because as the stone travels this way, it's going to slowly open the lid of the saw and then you'll have your oil spray coming out and you'll be losing lubrication. If you're not careful and you aren't paying attention and your saw is opening up like that, you could actually eventually throw enough oil out of the saw to cause uh, a feeding failure. So, because this stone had a kind of flat backside to it, I was able to take one cut most of the way through the stone this way and then using a chisel and a hammer, break that end off. And uh, 
This end was just easier to clamp, just the stone is a little asymmetrical, so it was a little tricky to work with, but once you have your first two end cuts, that's the hardest part. Oh, and I also took a cut down here so that when it stood upright, it wouldn't push the lid open. So this cut, let's see, how many inches long is that? About 11 inches. And this took a little over an hour and a half, by memory. Maybe just about an hour and 40 minutes. And that's because the saw blade cuts very slowly. So what's going on is the carriage here can lock onto this feed screw that goes underneath it. And the feed screw is turned by this belt. So the belt is running the drive. There's a pulley over here that goes to a worm gear. And the worm gear is basically like a spindle. It slowly drives the stone forward at a consistent cutting rate. So based on what speed you set it, it's gonna cut at a continuous speed rate. For Jasper, we cut on our largest pulley option, which is the slowest feed cut. And that's because Jasper's a really hard and tough stone. So when you're clamping your rock, you need to have no movement. If the stone can wiggle, then your blade is ruined. And these blades can be $250 to $500 a blade, depending on what kind of diamond blade you're running. On ours, I've got one of Highland Park's Agate Eater Blades, and they're really good blades. They last a very long time, and they need to be sharpened. So I'm gonna show you guys that in just a second and explain that concept. But once you have the ends cut off of a rock you're working, you're, you've got the hardest part done, because from here, you'll be able to take your pass cuts without having to reclamp your stone. So the first goal of the process when you're starting with a rough rock is get it squared up. You want two cut faces to hold on to, and what you're gonna end up doing once you have your orientation chosen is you're gonna hang the stone out of the clamp and use a board over here to keep it back pressured. And that's gonna let you have a lot of rock hanging over here so that when you use your cross feed, after your cut, you can pull the stone over like so. You can count your turns or you can measure from here to here to determine your thickness and then you take your next slice. So to make one sharpening stone, you need quite a few cuts. You gotta take two end cuts on your initial boulder. On this one, we took a third one just to make it fit in the saw. So that was most of yesterday for cutting. That was about five hours of cutting or so. And you know, then you throw in a little bit of time too to get your stone clamped properly. And then for a slab, it's two more cuts and then probably four more cuts at that point to trim out the final shape. So quite a bit of cutting goes into just making one stone. The beauty of working with a big saw like this is it lets you take multiple slabs at once once you get your end cuts sorted. So that's gonna give you the most opportunities for a good, clean sharpening stone. Now, as you're cutting wet stones, it's always a gamble because the inside of this rock may have voids or fractures or soft mineral lines that actually fall out of the stone and then leave you know, a, a surface that's not as conducive to fine, harp, fine honing or uh, rough sharpening. You don't want a stone that has pock marks in it and you don't want a stone that's got cracks because then you may put a lot of effort into something that doesn't turn out to perform well or actually is easier to break. So I'm gonna take and eyeball beneath the stone and make sure that it looks like it's clear of the flange washer. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So we're gonna come down here. You can see our board. And that is helping us clear those washers back there. If your stone isn't clear of the washer, you're gonna run into it and jam up the blade, potentially break something in the feed mechanism or burn out your blade or all a number of things. So that's the biggest reason for being really careful. Every cut that's set up, you have to be mindful to use the tolerances of the saw properly. So I can see from over here that we're definitely above the flange washer. And then the next thing to do is make sure the board itself is not gonna hit the washer. And I think my final orientation that I want to make the most biggest slices through the center and middle parts of the rock will be going this way 
So after this end is taken off, I can then turn my stone. Nine to 10 inches is about the ideal tolerance because if you're too high up, the blade is gonna struggle and you're gonna have less pressure holding the rock down. So there's a chance that the saw blade kind of feeds and doesn't cut at a proper rate if you're not careful and it starts to kind of give you upward pressure. So I noticed that on one of my last cuts, cutting a big block of jade, and jade is a very, very tough, hard to cut material. So it showed me that one, my oil wasn't clean enough, and two, my saw blade was not sharp enough. So the way to fix the saw blade issue is you take a file, and you're gonna wanna very evenly and carefully ping each segment. And what that does is it breaks open the glaze. Eventually, the centered diamond gets a glaze over it. This happens from dirty oil and just from lots of cutting. So you ping it like that and it actually breaks open a fresh new layer of the diamond grit and exposes the teeth, so to speak. Because cutting really hard stones like this will start to dull your blade, but sharpening it like that will make your blade last hundreds of times longer. This blade's actually already been going for about two years. So uh, taking care to properly clamp Keep your blade sharpened, keep your oil clean, don't run into the flange washer. And then the last thing is don't over tighten this back here. You can break your grip system with too much pressure. So and when you sharpen the blade like I showed, you're going to turn the blade slowly. It took me about a half hour because you have to very carefully ping each segment. Um, also the other thing to check too is that you haven't lost any teeth. So if you turn the diamond blade and you see you're missing a tooth, then that's something you need to replace. You can actually buy replacement diamond segments for these blades, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna get my board clear. But I'm still using it as my height base. And that kind of helps you feel like, yeah, is the stone clear? Yes, yeah, lift it up, good. As long as it doesn't drop below that line, you won't have a catastrophic failure. All right. Now, you can do two different things for the tightening. Option one is use your hands and go till it hurts. But if you're not very strong with your arms and your hands and your back, another option is use something like this. Now, you wanna be careful that on the teeth in this tray, the back of the vice pin, um, the foot of it, it needs to be centered on that tooth. So if you have a slight angle, then you don't have consistent pressure through the clamp. So that's something to consider. Now, I don't need to back pressure this stone because I have three fourths of it in the clamp and the middle of the stone is held in place. So I know when I lock this down, it's not gonna dance on me. The hardest part is getting stones started those first cuts when you're working with a very round rock are very tricky. And a lot of times I'll take a little bit of a cut, back it up and then take another cut, back it up. And by starting and stopping a few times, I can cut a notch that I know is gonna give me a straight through the stone kind of a cut. If you try to cut into a rounded surface and the blade deflects, then you, you pretty much have ruined your saw blade. All right, so one more note on not breaking your vice grip, listen to the sound it makes. When it starts to scream, that's, that's when it's time to stop tightening. So that's, that's more like a groan, but you'll hear it go a little higher pitch and a little louder and go one more. There we go. That's that sound I hear when it's really getting tight and really hard to tighten. So I stop there. Now, one more really cool modification that this saw has that new ones don't have that I think Highland Park should start doing is there's a welded catch on the front. So that screw only goes right into one little pocket. The new ones don't come with this hardware. This was added on and the new ones usually just drive a spot straight into this um, iron base plate, but that can play a little bit. And I think it's it's actually more likely to break over time. Now, because this carriage is so old, the metal has popped here from too much back pressure. And then this was designed so that 
now the pressure kind of keeps its catch pin pushing up instead of back. So eventually this here will fail, but not before I buy a replacement for it, hopefully. <laughs> All right, we got our rock clamped down very tight. Now we need to set our travel distance. So unlock the thumb screws underneath the carriage and then using the uh, cross feet over here, we're gonna come until we're totally clear of the blade. Like so. And now, if you have a previous distance over on your, your feed chain set, you'll need to take that off. Now I can push my stone how far I want it to go. And again, you can look and see that you're clear of the flange. Yep, if I look down and I look through this line, totally clear. And I'm gonna eyeball where the height of the cut's gonna be. It's gonna be about there. So it looks like we've lined it up real perfectly. Our oil is nice and clean. Blade is freshly sharpened. So we should be through the hardest part of the process and ready to cut for many more months before we need to clean or, sh or uh, sharpen again. Actually, we'll probably sharpen the blade in a couple weeks just to keep it, keep it fresher. All right, last part of this process, before we start the cut, wheel back over. Careful not to bump your lid and drop it on yourself. And also, I usually pull my head back and wipe the lip of the lid with my hand a few times just to try not to get dripped on. It's a bit of a workout. This stone probably still weighs 60 or 70 pounds. Okay, one last part I forgot to mention is that this carriage has some safeties put here so that you can't move it too far over because this part eventually could be touching your flange if you're not careful. So you really need to know your tolerances and you need to know how far you can move your cross feet over. I think individually saws may be slightly different. The other 24 inch saw I have, you can move the carriage all the way over and it doesn't touch. On this one, that's not the case. So probably just subtle changes that have happened in this machine's design over the decades that it's been around. All right, I can feel that I'm hitting my stop point. And now let's see if the blade has a square, a nice and square and flat entry point. So you're gonna just gently bump the blade and with your eye, look straight down the line. What you're looking for is if the blade starts to go like this. And you'll hear it if you've got like a rounded corner, you'll hear the blade push over a little. You don't want to deflect your blade because then it's ruined. So now that I've checked and made sure that I have a square entry, I'm pretty much ready to start the cut. You can see that the blade has a nice entry on this corner that I busted off the stone. We've clamped it really tight. One more thing to look for too is that you don't want a big gap at the top of the clamp here. Like this is fine. I'm not gonna put a wedge in there, but if you have too much space in there, you should put a wooden wedge and that'll keep extra pressure on your rock and keep it from moving. All right, so now the fun part. We're gonna just wheel over here. Our cut distance has been set and we're ready to start. So we'll check back in with you guys and start the video again after this cut's finished. And we'll turn the stone around and then we'll try cutting through it the tall way and we'll get the biggest possible slabs. Hopefully we'll get some extra large bench stones I have several on back order at the moment. All right, tighten down the thumb screws. Check the carriage alignment. Lock the feed screw. And now this is gonna slowly drive the stone through the saw blade. 
and it cuts about as fast as the clock turns. All right, she's ready to go. So you'll hear when the stone starts to get dinged by the blade. The cutting sound is real obvious and I loosely babysit while this cuts. It will shut itself off when it reaches that chain distance. And the main reason to be babysitting is in case you have a belt failure or something else in the saw hangs up and you need to manually turn it off. So you can see there's the worm gear that the drive shaft is on. Power feed system, drive belt, motor belt. These pulleys could be changed to a larger size to make the machine cut slower. And also if you wanted to cut faster on a softer material, you could change to a smaller pulley. All right, I can hear it starting to contact the stone. So we'll come back in about an hour and a half when that cut finishes. So the structure looks really good on this stone on each direction I've cut. So it seems like it's still a good candidate for some bigger slices this way next. So let's change the orientation of the rock so we can really slab it. Just for fun, I like to see if I can untighten it by hand, even though I used a wrench earlier. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Although it did turn a little bit.
So, I'm using this big chunk of Wyoming jade, olive jade with quartz. Gorgeous stuff. Makes a great heavy counterbalance when you're trying to hang your stone out. You don't want it to be dipping down as you try to tighten it. So this pressure keeps my backboard from getting lifted up on the lever that's created underneath this. And uh, at this point, we don't want to leave this here for the cut, but we also don't want this guy to tip himself out of the saw, so we're gonna try to move it by hand. If it can wiggle, then we need to rethink the, uh, the clamping situation. But if it doesn't move, then the vise has got it to a proper level of tightness. All right, let's see if she'll budge. Now, you should wear safety glasses or have your face behind something because sometimes stones will fracture when you try to pull them and they're being wedged. Okay, tiny bit of play in the carriage, but the stone is not moving in the vise, so that is exactly what we want. So, now that the rock is hanging out of the saw, we'll have a bunch of pass cuts that we can make before we run out of room on that crossways down here. So we're gonna wheel the carriage back this way, and that's gonna let us start cutting this stone closer to the edge here. And that way we can make a few passes and get a couple of real thick sheets out of the middle. So with a stone that's really heavy, you gotta be careful with your cross feed screw because it puts a lot of torque and pressure on this handle. This one's a little bit loose and a little worn, but still does the job as intended. Eventually, the finer mechanisms in the carriage need to be replaced because the bronze bushings do wear and get slop over time. Another thing too is that the feed screw needs to be pretty tight in that rear bushing and that's usually one of the first things that wears out and changes. Now unfortunately that usually means you have to take the entire carriage and rails off. If Highland Park could come up with a way to uh, make it easier to extract those old bushings by maybe having a way to put it in from the rear, that would solve that problem. But, you know, if you replace it and you're careful with your extraction, sometimes you can get it out without having to take everything off, but usually it's a several hour process for a couple dollar part. <laughs> so I usually let them wear out a bit, and then when I reach back there and move it and there's too much slop, eventually that's when it's gotta be changed. This one's nearing that point, but it's not there yet. I think that bushing was put in a year ago, maybe two years ago. All right, we're gonna check our distance again. Yep, that's about right. I don't wanna go all the way through the corner just because it's really, it's maxing out the capabilities of the blade, so I want to stop a little early. It's above the flange, so let's wheel back over. All right, let's see if that's a flat contact. I think we're right at the edge of where we can start to begin to get a square corner. Yeah, it's almost hanging off. Now the thing to think about is if we move a lot farther over, we start to lose how many pass cuts we can make. And because this isn't a th very thin saw blade, because I chose it for how robust it is, it does waste more material. So that's another thing to consider. Thinner saw blades, you'll run through them a lot faster because they have a lot less diamond. Well, I don't see the blade bouncing side to side too hard, but let's just give it a few more turns and see if it's better. Or worse. 
about the same. We don't want to be above the top of the blade and this back corner gets close. So I think it's a good thing that the cut's going to end about there. Let's do the old start and stop trick and we'll make this flat contact even flatter. Just letting it barely touch and then we'll back up the carriage and we'll start it again. So with the start and stop technique, you need a pretty flat contact already. If it's like moving over just a little bit, that's about enough. But if you have something that's too slippery to get the cut started, then this notching technique doesn't work. Also, when you cut really long stones, eventually you'll notice where your feed is worn out. This saw, the feed is actually a little more worn out at the front than it is the middle and the back because the cuts have started there the most. So sometimes if I set it too far back, it actually struggles to get started. All right, so I can hear it just tickling the rock. When it starts to hit it on the full rotation in about another five seconds. There we go, sound's changing. That's it. You don't want to get too far into it because you really only just want to be creating a little bit of an opening. And it's good to hear that the blade stops without a lot of pressure. You could hear it, nah, 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 and it kind of it just wobbles itself to stop instead of hanging up when it stops. <sighs> well, that's about it on that opening cut. And then we'll get to see what's inside of it after that skin is off. And then we'll decide how thick to make the next cut. So I'll see you guys back here again in another hour and a half to two hours. Right. The end result is a semi-translucent, monster-sized slab. It's a pleasing mix of tan and gray with some kind of foggy looking clouds in it and some nice flashes of crimson base, translucent color of kind of a yellow color. That's about two days of cutting to get this slab. Next, we'll just be sanding the surface and then it'll be ready to sharpen.